Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down. Oh, no, I'm going to do this again because I, I'm reading the wrong introduction. I apologize, Reeve. No problem. Welcome to the Cross Border Interview, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada, and we will be learning about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe that the best way to understand a community is, shockingly, to talk to people who actually live and work in those communities. And that's why we are so honored to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome to the show Reeve Corina Williams of Northern Sunrise County in the province of Alberta. Reeve, morning, Chris. Show. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So, uh, Reeve, I want to get to the first question, and it's the million dollar question to open up all these interviews. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? I think when I was elected as, as council, um, it's an honor. You, you really hold that position as an honor. And that's where I really take that strongly that I want to be there for the people that have voted me in and to be able to answer any questions that they may be bringing up. Was municipal politics always the first choice for you or uh, growing up, did you ever think you'd be getting involved in municipal politics? How did your journey to being the Reeve of your county come about? I was actually a massage therapist for 28 years and beekeeping with my my husband because we own an apiary so I really didn't get into politics until six years ago and it was my community that started laying a hint shall we say that I think you'd be really good to do that you should look into that so I thought about it and I actually sat in council for six months I attended council meetings because I had no idea what I was getting into. So I sat in council so I could get an understanding of how do, how does this process work? What's, what, what is actually going on and how can I make a difference? And I noticed that my passion was really growing for it. And here I am today. So was politics discussed at the dinner table? Because you don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to run for council, even with pressure. Like, you must have had some semi-knowledge of what the political experience was going to be like. Or are you relatively green when it comes to municipal politics or even politics in general? Had anyone run in your family prior? My my father, when we lived in England, tried to run into local politics. Unfortunately, he wasn't successful but we would we would talk around the table of the, of the politic world when I was growing up. So I do have that little bit of base knowledge there. But when I ran in the election, when I met my residents, I told them I am learning from scratch here and you're going to get an honest opinion whether you like it or not. This is how I run. <laughs> So what happened in 2017? Because you said people were talking to you and approaching you to run, but you ultimately have to make that final decision. You have to finally say, okay, now it's time. What was that push over the edge for Karina Williams to finally say, okay, let's do it? It was after speaking with my family and getting the support from them that really made the ultimate difference. I asked them, can I can I do this? Do you think I can do this? Um, do I have your support? And their answers were always positively, Mum, we know what whatever you do, you're going to do a hundred percent. And we we we're right behind you. So that was the ultimate backing, shall we say, that I needed. You you decide to run in 2017, you put your name on the ballot, and it's a unique experience for a lot of people. Because while you may think you have a pulse on the community, you might understand what the issues are, whether you may be green to municipal politics or a lifelong learner of municipal politics. When you go talk to people, it's a different experience in its entirety. For you, when you were out asking for people's votes and asking them what their issues and concerns were, 
Were there things that were coming up that you were maybe shocked about? It was. It was surprising. Um, a lot of it was roads, of course, your dusty roads, um, where calcium is, where calcium isn't for dust control. Can my road be paved was one I heard quite often. And the answer I could give them was, we, we can do as much as we possibly can, but that will in increase taxes because of the cost that you're asking to be to be uh, for that road to be finished the way you would like it to be done and it's sometimes residents don't realize the cost and also um being as a councillor you you're not into administration you can't go in and tell one of your administration i want you to go and do that because that's not what we're here for. We're here for policy and governmental. So that's an area that the residents often don't don't realize. You you ultimately are successful on election night in 2017, but I want to talk about that ballot experience. Because going into that ballot box and putting an X beside your name is a surreal experience. I don't care if you're the mayor of Toronto or the small town mayor in the northern Alberta. The experience is the same because you are now putting an X beside your name and saying, I'm the best person for you. What was that experience like to go into that ballot box, to go vote for yourself? And did you get that same feeling the second time when you ran in the last municipal election? It was, take a deep breath, <laughs> you've got this, shaking a little bit, and then put your name in that box and walk away because that you've done it. <laughs> you've, you've completed that, that X, your paper is in, and now it's the waiting. And was the waiting the hardest part for you? The first time around, absolutely. <laughs> Why is that? We're, you're all in the room because there were three of us running oh. at the time in in the Three Creeks Wesley Creek ward. So you you don't know what's going to happen. It's you have no idea, even though you have conversations with your residents. I never really asked anybody, "Do I have your vote?" I didn't think that was the appropriate question to ask. All I could tell them was this is who I am, you'll always get an honest response. As I said, you may not like the response, but you will get one. And if I can't give you a response or I can't give you the correct information, I'll find someone that can, because I'm not gonna give you an answer if I'm not confident in that answer. You you ultimately are elected. The blue check mark goes beside your name. You are the next counselor for your ward, your area. I'm not sure if there are wards in uh, the county, but in your area. For you, the moment of celebration is short-lived because the real work begins right afterwards. Because in Alberta, you have to pass a budget. You have to get down to the nitty-gritty. For you, what was that transition life from being public uh i mean private karina williams to now being councillor elected now councillor williams i can honestly say the first year i think i looked like a deer in headlights there's so much information coming to you and until you're sitting on the other side of the chair you really don't know i was shocked how much information you need to to be aware of to learn and that first budget process, it's it's really difficult. It took me hours to to read it and try and wrap my mind around, okay, this is for this part, this is for administration, for council, as all the, the budget planning process goes forward. So what advice would you give a relatively new person to politics? Because you've been in it for six years. You have, I, I, I would say you have a sort of a better understanding and a better feel of what you're doing. What advice would you give a potential first-term councillor right now? Because in BC, Manitoba, Ontario, there was a lot of changeover. What advice would you give those new-term councillors? Patience. 
you really learn patience. Patience in municipal politics? Reeve, come you on. Really, you really, you go in thinking, okay, I can make a difference. I can change whatever it is that you've run on. I actually didn't run on anything specific. I just ran on my honesty. But if you are going in with something that you're wanting to do, the likelihood of you completing that in your first year is extremely low. Why do you say that? Because there's so much information and you you all of a sudden realize that residents have more power than you do. Because we're mandated by the Municipal Government Act, you're mandated in such a way that you can just go in and choose to put an option on the floor and expect council to be behind you all of a sudden. You, you, that first term, I want to particularly focus on this first term. Um, you, you don't have political experience, but you have to gain it really quickly as a, a local counselor, because you deal with issues that are a range of issues, whether it be your local roads, whether it be potholes, whether it be uh, bridges, whether it be healthcare potentially as well, or education. You have to become uh, basically an encyclopedia on a range of issues in that first term and then carry it over into your second term. How big of the learning curve did you have to put yourself on to understand the issues that were presented to you in front of council each time that you went there? It's an uphill, uphill climb that's pretty much <laughs> vertical. <laughs> does it get easier, though? Where's the silver it, lining in? It does get easier. I think once you've done your first full term, you get a better understanding. I would say after your first year, your second year gets a little easier. Your third and your fourth, you're really starting to get an understanding of how everything comes together and how everything works. And by then you've attended a lot of conferences. You get to know the other municipalities around you. You get to know the other councillors, mayors and reeves and start having those conversations of how can we advocate for the particular issue that we're seeing here. I, I often say municipal government is the front line of government because you are in your community. You are in your community 24 seven. You're not going off to Edmonton. You're not going off to Ottawa to do your job. You are literally doing your job in your community. In your six years in office, have you found the work-life balance uh, acceptable? Because I can imagine there's days you just want to go out to the grocery store and grab a jug of milk or a carton of milk and come home. But for some rural counselors, that could be a two-hour excursion where you're going out and you're going to be dealing with people coming up to you and asking you questions. Have you found that balance? And what does that balance look like to you in your community? So for me... I really don't mind it, to be honest. Really? I like being, I really don't mind it. If anyone has a, a question, I'll, I'm there to answer them. That's where I take the honor of my job very strongly. I'm, I'm here to be here for you. There is a joke within my family, as they always say, mum's 10 minute trip is always going to be an hour. So give her the time. <laughs> And mom knows everybody. So I want to turn now to my second segment. And before I start this segment, I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the Reeve and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. We seem to get a lot of emails that people assume that this is what you're about to say is the bee's knees of what council feels and what they want. No, this is the opinion of the Reeve when I ask her this question. Reeve Williams, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing Northern Sunrise County as of recording this interview? Uh, definitely pr provincial downloading. We're seeing it constantly that the downloading from mental health, from RCMP, um, all the areas that we used to have grants for or or have accessibility to grants those are taken away the msi which is municipal sustainability is now changing to lgff which is your local fiscal framework 
we don't know what that's going to look like. And a municipality cannot run on it on a deficit. So we're really seeing that downloading is, is growing. Um, a good example is our FCSS services. While the, the budget has increased by 5 million overall for the province, many municipalities are certainly paying over that 20% that the provincial government feels that we are actually paying. Now, for those who have listened to the cross-border interviews, uh, uh, Reeve Williams and I have done two episodes, one on the rural impact of uh, unpaid oil and gas property taxes, and then also one with her fellow uh, Reeves from up in northern Alberta. I want to stick on this because I think this is the most important issue that not a lot of people deal with right now, not a lot of people know about right now, and that is that downloading aspect Rural communities like yours, whether it be Northern Sunrise, whether it be Lesser Slave Lake, whether it be MD of Peace, um, they're facing a lot of challenges right now. You just talked about the RCMP back pay. You, we've talked about the oil and gas property taxes. While your community might not have been largely affected, it is affected. How do municipalities like yours, uh, Reeve, navigate these challenging times because on top of the downloading we have this thing called inflation which is causing a lot of services levels to go up so how do municipalities and counties like yours deal with this uncertain economic time well for for first off rural municipalities are very stringent very careful with their budgets anyway um, I would say we're we're all in the area of what what are we required to do rather than versus what's nice to have. So we're always thinking that way through the budgetary lines. But we have strong advocation that we do through Northern Sunrise County through resolutions, meeting with ministers, bring that awareness to them that the decisions they're making ultimately are affecting the bottom lines of municipalities and we're the ones that service the industries, the agriculture for their roads so that industry or agriculture can actually get to where they need to be. And that's a cost. Do you feel heard? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Reeve. It's just, um, I I recently had the opportunity to speak with uh, Reeve Paul McLaughlin, president of RMA, and we had that conversation where sometimes it feels like you're being heard, and sometimes it feels like you're screaming into a void, and nothing gets done for you, especially in more northern rural areas. Are you? Do you feel like you're being heard by your local MP, but also your local MLAs? We, we can have those conversations. Do we necessarily get the answers we're looking for? <laughs> Likely not. Um, but until you have that conversation, until you have that awareness, are they even aware that there's an issue? So I'm going to ask the question again. There's okay. only one tax base. There's only one uh, resident of your community. Your, your residents are the same residents the MLA has and the MP has. When issues of downloading come into play, are your residents willing to hear about these issues? And are they understanding of the fact that while your property taxes are going to go up 3% or 2% or even 1%, it's not because the fiscal mismanagement of the county, it's because the county is now dealing with issues that they were not dealing with a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Yeah, we, we keep open communication with our residents. So we like to try and keep them updated as much as we can and let them know what's happening as far as whether it's provincially or, or federally. So if uh, those conversations have to come about, we like to keep them prepared. However, we're, we've been in a position where we've actually reduced our taxes, our residential taxes by 20% because we were understanding that there, we're all struggling with the cost of groceries, with fuel, carbon tax, all those expenses that we're seeing going higher. 
we wanted to try and help our residents out as much as we can. And this is one way that we were able to do that. What does the future look like for the county? Because these costs don't seem to be going away. And you cannot run deficits as you openly state it. Municipalities, I mean, you, I, people's budgets are people's budgets, but municipalities can't run deficits. How do you see yourself navigating the next few years into into the next general election, potentially, to offset some of these downloads onto the from the people? Because people, like you said, people are struggling and they want some relief and you need to look at service cuts or raising taxes, one or the other. There's no other option there. Definitely. We're fortunate that we're not in that position at the moment. Okay. We do have quite a quite larger reserve. The, the previous council for many years built that up. However, the discussions around the council chamber is always, how is this going to affect the budget? That's the question that comes up all the time when we're making the big decisions of if there's major expansions or um, new bridge files or anything that comes forward that people or the province isn't always aware of. So we hear of other municipalities trying to get grants for their large bridge files that are in the millions of dollars and Sometimes we hear the good news and sometimes we hear the bad news that the amount that they're going to get is extremely small. So we do feel for those municipalities. We do also have some large bridge files here as well. Um, we're fortunate again that those are funded fortunately with our reserves. You talk about how Northern Sunrise County is broken into different uh, uh, areas and which make divisions, I should say, which make up each one of the councillors. While you are there, like you said earlier in the interview, to represent your area that you've been elected, as council, though, you have to look at the county as a whole. I want to know from you and how you see your role as Reeve of balancing the needs of your areas in your community, in your county with the needs of the entire county, because I've lived in small rural communities and I can tell you sometimes it feels like uh, area four is getting more funding than area two. Area two is getting less funding than area three. So you as Reeve and council have to look at these issues and divide the money evenly, but also look at the county and sometimes forget about, not forget, but put off issues in one area to the following year to fix issues in a certain area. So how do you as Reeve balance the needs of your different communities in your county? So the conversation around the county is always what we do for one, we do for all. We have a strong f f philosophy with that, with the, the conversations around council. So there could be something that's come up that is emergent in nature, that perhaps that previous project does have to be moved another year because that emergent project ta is taking precedence. That is always on the option of safety. So if, if, if it's a safety risk to our residents, we will put that precedent first. And that's the whole communication cycle with the residents to let them know, we have this in the budget for this year. However, this happened, we're now having to bump that for the, for the following year. And when you have that open communication, most times the residents are understanding because we think about safety as whole for the community. But sometimes they, the resident will believe that their issue is the most pressing issue. While communications is great and communications is needed, you need to make the ultimate decision, whether it be against someone's interest or for someone's interest. How do you see yourself, while a safety is a big concern, looking at the individual needs and balancing the individual needs against the county. Because I can imagine there's days where John might come up to you and say, my pothole is the biggest pothole in my count in the county and it needs to be fixed. I've worked in a small rural community. I know that issue has come up on numerous occasions, but 
John's pothole is actually smaller than Sarah's pothole down the street. And that one needs to be fixed before John's. And at this time, there is only budget to fix one. Will will you go out or will the counselor in the area go out and talk to John and say, John, I, I know it's bad, but right now there's other areas that are worse off. And it comes back to communications, I understand, but you are there to represent the people and you also need to balance the growth of the community. Oh, absolutely. Can you hear the background noise here, Chris? Okay, I got a lot of people talking next to me, so I wanna make sure you nope. can hear that. Okay, um, sorry, will you be able to cut this part out? I'll, I'll answer your question. So to me, that is speaking to that resident openly and giving them the full picture. Sometimes when a resident has a problem, it's only their problem that they see, which is fair enough because it is a problem to them. And we understand that. It's more of giving the whole picture of if we do this, then it's going to cost this amount. We don't have it in the budget right now. However, how can we look at doing it a different way? Is there a different option we can use that may assist you in, in bridging that, that project or the, um, the concern that you have? And generally speaking, that's the best way that we, we find a solution to that. I want to turn to my sort of new segment I'm adding into this, and I did not prepare you for this. So this is going to be, see how, see how you can answer this question. Apathy has been a big thing in municipal governments over the last few years. We are seeing voter turnout go down. We are seeing people engaged in municipal politics even go down further. We're also seeing the, the lines are blurring about residentials under residents understanding of what jurisdictions the federal government has the provincial government and the municipal government in your community of northern sunrise county do you believe that there is an apathetic undertone or do you believe that people are actually engaged and understanding of the issues that are presented in front of your county I, I feel for our, our residents, I feel for Northern Sunrise County, there's so much information that's coming out to them from so many different angles that it's got to be confusing for them. How can you how can you set forward the truth when it's coming at so many different angles that I feel for them? How can unless your unless your understanding of municipal provincial or federal policies or uh, po politicians you may not understand and we know for sure that if they don't have an answer there will be an answer filled in that gap whether it's the correct one or not i could not agree more and it's always challenging to fight back against the mistruths that uh, are spread so easily when it comes to what jurisdictions and what policies and policies are put in place from different jurisdictions. So I give you credit to try and even challenge that. Well, and I always tell my residents, if you have a question, call me, you know, yeah. my phone number. <laughs> if, if you hear something that you're concerned of, please call me. And that's the easiest way to nip something in the bud, shall we say, if, if there is an untruth out there. It does happen. There's coffee talk all the time. And it's up to us as municipal councillors to give them the correct information or let them know that what they've heard, part of it could be true, part of it could be a little offset from the truth. I want to turn to my last segment because I am very cautious of time and I want to make sure that you get to your next meeting in time, uh, Reeve Williams. And I want to talk about my favorite subject, tourism. I love tourism. I love spending my tourism dollars in Canada for some reason. Not a lot of people do, but I'm one of those people. I've said, if you come on my show, I will be up in your county spending my economic dollars in your community. So be prepared to see Chris Brown in Northern Sunrise County later this year. But before I get there, I, I like having plans. So Reeve Williams, 
What are some of the tourist destinations in your community that people should see when they're, or what are some of the things that people can do in Northern Sunrise County while they're there? With our square kilometer area of 21,000 kilometers, there's many options available to you. We have the wonderful CT Park that has a very famous bouncy pillow. So if you come up to Northern Sunrise, we will get you on the pillow for sure. We have some beautiful walking trails. We have the Harmon Valley Campground. We have Murphy's Flats that has a wonderful view of the river. You can actually canoe down to it and have a picnic and carry on canoeing, or you can come down via a vehicle, have a nice day picnic and move on again. We've got uh, snow trails. The Harmon Valley Park is actually open all year round now. So we have snowshoe trail, we have um, ski, skiing trails. The Wesley Creek is very, um, it's getting quite famous now because the Peace Valley snowmobile riders have got a, a great committee behind them and all those trails now are interactive. So you can go on a very long snowmobile ride through the county and see some beautiful areas. We have grew our trail that um, from the ar archeologists are saying it's one of the oldest trails in Northern North America. And you can actually walk that trail and, and see the views of the valley and it's an in interactive trail. So it's a beautiful trail we have so many different parks every ward has a park so you can actually go park park jumping for the day if if you have young children provincial parks so or uh <clears throat> municipal or municipal parks M municipal parks yeah okay. we have two great ag societies here as well that do rodeos and hold dressage we've so, got areas you can have open barbecues so it sounds like it's a very outdoorsy type of community, which I always love. So I'm looking forward to it. I might have to bring my camp camping gear up there so I could make sure I get experience the full true effect of Northern Sunrise. But what about yourself? Where do you go after a stressful day of council, a long day of meetings? Is there a local watering hole? Is there a local area that you go and just decompress after a long day? I usually go for a walk somewhere. I'll usually drive off somewhere and <laughs> just walk around out in the boonies, just me and my dog. I usually take a dog because you never know with the bears, but <clears throat> that's what I do. I, I just like to explore a different area of Northern Sunrise that maybe I haven't explored yet. So that's what I like to do. So I want to end on the million dollar question. And this is the most important question of this entire interview, Reeve. And you can take as long or as short to answer this as you want. Reeve Williams, in your opinion, what makes Northern Sunrise County such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I, we have a huge community here. Our neighbors are fantastic. Anywhere you live in the county, you'll have a neighbor that is, that is there for you. We have a great SCSS program that we do lots for families, lots for seniors. We have a very successful senior um, supper program and a senior lunch program. We have, out, like you had said, outdoors, we have a beautiful area. Our, our economic development works very well with our businesses where we want to see our, our industry either survive and expand, which is always positive for the county itself. Economic development, we know, is very important wherever you are. And economic, economic development and tourism actually go together really, because if you can develop that tourism, you'll likely develop the industry that comes with it. We actually have 336 home businesses in Northern Sunrise County. Um, we have a website that our economic development is set up. 
so anybody can search for something that they're looking for and it's very easy to find they'll have the contact information so we try and help our economic development as much as we can and as tourism we're partners with the mighty peace tourism and that really does showcase the beautiful areas that we have here we have a fishing hole at CT Park that's naturally stocked with trout. And we recently added a floating dock for those with disabilities because we recognize that those with disabilities should have the same um, way of enjoying as anybody else. So that we've done that. Our CT Park is actually paved, so you can have a nice walk around there. There's outdoor equipment there if you want to be outside and exercise. Our Harmon Valley Park, as I had said, has camping stalls available and the firewood is free. When you come down there, have a nice fire, beautiful um, walking trails down there. So much of the boreal forest is down there as well. So you can explore your plants. We have a huge agriculture development here as well. So our farmers, it's beautiful in the summer when you drive around and see all the fields of all the crops and it it's just you go from that beautiful yellow of canola to a field of healthy looking wheat to maybe a field of peas and the diverse it's so diverse it's great to see we have <clears throat> many of our residents have joined the alice program which is alternative land use services so we have um, a tree planting program Last year, our residents planted 7,000 trees. So we're really careful in trying to expand and be aware of our environmentally friendly and keep be aware of our wetlands and um, our road structures and how that affects. And we work well with our farmers to showcase sometimes their farming methods may go into a ditch and it's part of that communication of saying, please be careful because you're you're ruining what we've just done. So I like to think we have a huge communication in, in the, the community and our community gets together when we have the St. Isidore Carnival. We have uh, the Easter Bunny is down at the Harmon Valley um, Act Society here coming up. And <coughs> when we hold events, we always have a great turnout and it's always great to hear the community come together. Take another drink, Grief. <laughs> We're wrapping <Yeah>. up here. <laughs> Sorry Reeve, about that. <laughs> hey, no worries. Thank you so much for doing this. Reeve Williams, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. This has been an honor, and I, I, I don't often say this, but I want to say this to you. Your community is better served with you at the council table, and we need more people like yourself who are in it for the right reasons, who are actually doing it to better their community. So thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this today. It was greatly appreciated. Thank you, Chris. And it's always a wonderful time where I can have a chat with you and ex we can explore the rural Alberta together. We certainly can, and I'm looking forward to visiting Northern Sunrise County later this year. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least 15 minutes a day. Go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day, and remember everyone, just keep talking. <laughs>